Yes. All right, thank you. Uh, good morning, uh, everyone. Um, a big thank you to the organizers for giving me the opportunity to uh, present some of the, the work that we've been doing on uh, the self-assembly kinetics of uh, linear virus-like uh, particles. Um, I apologize for my voice. I'm, I'm a Dutch person, so I don't do well in, at elevated temperatures and under the influence of sunlight. <laughs> so anyway, so these virus-like uh, uh, particles uh, consist of uh, a strand of uh, a double-stranded uh, DNA, uh, which have been encapsulated by uh, um, a tri-block um, recombinant biosynthetic protein. And uh, I'll show you uh, the chemical structure later on in my talk. Um, this biosynthetic protein, which actually was designed to mimic the functionality of the code proteins of a tobacco mosaic virus. Many moons ago, we investigated theoretically both the stability and the assembly kinetics of a tobacco mosaic virus, and that led us, helped us to design um, this, uh, this protein. Um, but uh, before, ah, uh, going on, uh, here are the, uh, um, my buddies in crime. Um, this is an experimental group who did all the experiments. There's the group of uh, Renko de Vries at uh, Wageningen University, which is in uh, the east uh, of the Netherlands. Um, the actual experiments were done by Armando uh, Hernandez Garcia, who is now at Northwestern. Um, we've actually, uh, I mean, he left two years ago. We've since done more experiments. I'll be reporting on the end of my talk, hopefully. Um, the theory gang um, is, well, consists of uh, Willem Kegel who seems part of the audience. And actually, Willem is the, the chap who drew me into physical virology. So uh, maybe, I don't know, 12 or 13 years ago, he sent me a manuscript about the self-assembly of tobacco mosaic virus, in fact. And I thought it was rubbish. <laughs> but we wrote a fantastic paper <laughs> about it. <laughs> no, 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 it's you, mate. <laughs> anyway, at the time, um, um, Daniela Kraft, who, who now is at Leiden University, was a PhD student with, uh, with Willem uh, doing experiments. Her background is uh, theoretical physics, so she turned to the dark side. And, but she wanted to have like a little toy theoretical problem. Um, so the first theory for the self-assembly kinetics was uh, done with Dan Daniela. Um, very recently, another chap, Mela Punter, who, is, uh, who was a, a master student in my group, he extended the model that Daniela and, and Willem and I uh, uh, coughed up so many years ago. OK, so what do we want? Oh, funding. Um, <laughs> it's rather important. You know, uh, funding virus-related topics is not that easy in the Netherlands, I think. I mean, we, 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 so we got some funding from NWO, which is the, the Dutch equivalent of the NSF, and the now def uh, defunct uh, Dutch Polymer Institute. Um, which were always extremely generous. And uh, I used to have a project with, uh, with the previous speaker, funded by uh, HFSP, and the, there's a chap sitting over there who, uh, who got a salary out of it. Anyway, uh, so our aim was to encapsulate DNA. Uh, the reason, I mean, in a way in the background, is gene therapy, double star on DNA, um, using a synthetic protein. Um, of course, you know, uh, viruses are the ultimate encapsulation machines. You know, they're made to infect things. So we thought, why not uh, imitate what nature does so well? Um, here on the left is an image of uh, CCMV, which is a plant virus. It's very, very small. It's just shy of 30 uh, nanometers across. About half the viruses have this, very, have this shape. Or, for instance, look at uh, tobacco mosaic virus, which is actually the first virus to be uh, discovered, I think. Um, that one is a lot longer. This is about 300 nanometers. Now, if you look at the internal structure of um, CCMV and TMV, it's actually quite different. They're very different. I mean, the shape difference is obvious, but also the way that the genome was encapsulated is very, very different. Um, if you look at uh, CCMV or any other small uh, plant virus, it consists of this shell, you know, of, of a protein. And inside this shell, you've got a cavity. And this cavity holds the genome. Uh, this is the genome, wherefore 
CCMV, you've got uh, th th three different particles, and they all have uh, roughly 3,000 nucleotides of single star RNA inside. Now, the driving force, so actually, I should say both these viruses have been reconstituted in, in vitro, which means that you can uh, disassemble um, the viruses into the proteins and the genome, you can purify them and, and then mix them into the same. Um, test tube, you swirl, I presume. I, that's what I think that experimentalists do. And lo and behold, it will self assemble. And the driving force, I mean, both, I mean, certainly for uh, CCMV, in the first instance, is electrostatic. So the, so the inner surface of uh, the virus is, is very highly positively charged. And this is also the reason why you can just yank out the, the, the RNA and replace it with anything else that is negatively charged like particles or droplets or whatever. Uh, in fact, uh, I don't know if, if Adam Zlotnick is in the audience yet, no? But actually, Adam Zlotnick encapsulated DNA. This is interesting because, you know, this particle is 30 nanometers across. The DNA has a persistence length of 50 nanometers. And there's no way that you can get DNA in this very, very, very small lumen. So the protein is... Um, easy, it will adapt to the template that you offer it. But it still has this preferred curvature that is, you know, like 30 nanometers. So what this protein does, it will grab hold of multiple strands of DNA and form a tube with a diameter of 30 nanometers. Now our goal was to encapsulate single RNAs, not bundles. And one reason would be that, well, you know, if you have a long, thin, long, thin object that's e more easily absorbed by cells than a fat one. Uh, so why not um, try the trick of a tobacco mosaic virus? Well, tobacco, to tobacco mosaic virus doesn't have a lumen. It has a hole which does run through the entire center of the object, but the RNA is not encapsulated in this lumen. It's actually embedded in, um, in the capsid itself. Right? Uh, this TMV will not encapsulate DNA, double stranded DNA. It, it will do um, single stranded if you force it to. So, our goal was now to try and combine you know, the, the, the properties of TMV and the properties of CCMV. So, the easy, so having a, th um, um, a, a, a physical driving force for the assembly and then still have use the tricks that TMV use in order to encapsulate something. Because, because as we shall see, that's not so trivial. Because it's a quasi-linear object. And uh, in fact, we already knew this about, I mean, quite a while. We tried to encapsulate single-stranded DNA, homopolymeric. So it cannot self-hybridize. So it's a polymer, like a homopolymer. And we try to do that with a synthetic molecule, which is a, a naphthalene derivative, which has three functionalities. It's got a functionality that will allow it to uh, hydrogen bond with the single uh, strand of DNA. Um, it got this planar group. This planar group will allow it to interact with itself and self-assemble along uh, the single strand of DNA. And then there is a group attached in order to increase its solubility in water. And uh, now, this homopolymeric DNA will not form a helix, which, which means that you can monitor helicity as, as a proxy for how much stuff is absorbed onto um, the DNA. Because, I mean, if you squint your eyes a little bit, actually quite a bit, then this looks a little bit like, like adenine, so ATCG. Right? So, um, so we, we mix them together. And what happens is we see a CD signal coming up. And this CD signal tells you that there is a co-assembly into a helical structure of the DNA. And that let's call that a coat protein. And uh, so this is what happens. So on the vertical axis, we've got the uh, normalized CD signal as a function of the concentration of, of this object relative to the concentration of the template. Um, for three different template lengths. So this is the longest, so 40 uh, nucleotides, 20, 10, and, and 5. 
So, so we're adding here more of the, of the code protein, and what we're seeing is that the CD signal increases, so it gets packaged, and the DNA gets packaged. Actually, it, it doesn't really get packaged at all. It's really difficult to get full 100% coverage of the DNA. And actually, with hindsight, that makes sense, of course, because it's like a one-dimensional absorption process. Entropy rears its ugly head and will create vacancies. Right? So, so TMV is smarter than this. At the time, we were not as smart as TMV. Um, you know, by um, fitting the experimental data to like an Ising-like model, we can extract you know, stacking energies and binding energies. Um, by doing the same experiments as a function of temperature, we can even you know, extract uh, and you know, uh, apply the model. We can extract enthalpies as well. And uh, so here again, uh, uh, CD signal versus now temperature for one concentration of uh, uh, 0.25 millimolars at this stoichiometric ratio. And by fitting the theory to, to the uh, experimental data, we get enthalpies of, let's say, about 20 kBT. Now, you, you, you can see that there is a reasonably well-defined um, elongation temperature. So what you can now do is um, plot this um, elongation temperature as a function of the concentration of uh, the code protein, the quotation mass code protein. And that gives us these straight lines, which you expect, um, actually, Van Hoff's law. And uh, now the interesting thing is what you can do is you can also not add the, uh, the template. And these objects will also self-assemble without the template. And, uh, but it does that at much, much, much lower temperatures. Except for this one, so this is G1, that's this, this one. Um, at large enough concentrations, actually what happens is that the self-assembly takes over from the templated assembly. So what you have is, is a competition between templated assembly and self-assembly. This is something that if we were to de design a virus, a linear virus, we have to um, make sure that does not happen. Oh, so it, Okay, so, so how does TMV do it? So TMV doesn't follow this, uh, this route. It doesn't rely on um, language type absorption. What TMV has is what is, is known as an, an origin of assembly sequence, which is the same thing as, a, as written as a packaging signal. And assembly actually happens bidirectional. It starts at this packaging signal and then runs that way. And then later on, in, in, the, in the last part of the assembly, the assembly goes in this direction. Let us forget that this is about 900 nucleotides upstream. Um, the, the, the RNA itself is uh, slightly over 6,000 nucleotides. So we can forget about the last part. The last part is boring. Um, now looking at images like this one, what, what we're seeing is indeed linear object growing as a function of time. And if you, if you focus uh, onto one of those images, you see a rod, and, you've got, and what you see is two strands of RNA coming out. The shortest strand is this bit over here. The longest strand, that's all of this that has not been encapsulated yet. Now, this is one of the views that um, people think how it, is how assembly happens. Under conditions of neutral pH and physiological salt, the protein itself is not in monomeric form. It's in this 34-CP uh, uh, bilayer disk. Actually, um, if you reduce the pH a little bit, this bilayer disk morphs into a, what they call a lock washer. Um, at low pH, this lock washer will then self-assemble into helices of various length. But we are at neutral pH, so this is a stable form. This means that uh, this form is a high energy structure. Now, what the origin of assembly does, it, it pokes its little finger. It's a, it's a stem loop uh, type thing, interestingly enough. It pokes its little finger into that hole, and it uses a conformational change in the protein. And it's this conformational change in the protein that actually causes this um, bilayer disk to morph into this lock washer. What next happens is that either monomers attached to this lock washer, or complete bilayer disks, 
which then also morph, induced by the first one that has already morphed. So this is a lustre. So actually turning this into this costs a lot of energy. Turning this one into that costs less energy because of the presence of the first one. And what then happens is that, is that this, um, the remaining part of the, of the RNA strand is drawn in through the hole in the middle and gets itself, finds itself lodged uh, in the core of the protein, which has undergone this, this conformational change. The question now, of course, is why so difficult? And actually, I should say, is this is not just TMV that does this. There's a whole bunch of viruses. Eh. Uh, papaya mosaic virus, uh, clover yellow mosaic virus, papaya ring spot virus, and tobacco, I forgot what the R means, a virus. So apparently this is the way to do it. Okay, so a teeny weeny bit of theory, not too much, because this helps us to design the protein. Let us just look at a simple language adsorption. So you have template, this is our DNA now, because yeah, our goal is to template DNA. And um, so if you have an attractive interaction between, well, the code proteins and the template, then you'll get language adsorption, which is not very cooperative. It is really difficult to get the, all of the binding sites covered by a code protein. So you could say, well, but you know, these proteins might interact. Uh, that reduces the interaction and energy further, so it becomes more negative, so that drives further assemblies. So far, so good, but still, it's a one-dimensional process, and, and entropy will make holes in this. Making holes in a capsid is not so good for the virus, because nucleases might just think, hmm, uh, something to nibble at. Right? That's the end of the virus. Right? So, uh, worse, if you allow the proteins also to interact, then they will also self-assemble in solution. Oh, not good either. Right? So, so binding will give you on the, this is good. Interactions are good, and interactions between proteins are bad as well because you get self-assembly. Now let's look at this at this red. This is also well in physics land everything is a sphere. This is a protein, a coprotein, and it's not assembly active. So it's in this in this low energy state. Um, let us presume that a template now has an origin of assembly, where these proteins would um, preferentially adsorb onto, and then change the conformational structure of that protein. Right? So it moves from red to green. It has to pay something for that. But now the protein can recruit other proteins which are of the wrong color, turn them into the right color, and gain, oh, whoops, OK and gain a free energy of binding, a free energy of, of interaction, lateral interactions, and then there is a little bit you have to invest to get the, the process started. Now, this is a nucleating process. Now, the statistical mechanics of this is really easy. It's called the zipper model. You have, uh, in essence, three knobs that you can turn. The first knob is what we call the mass action variable. And this mass action variable is a product of the concentration of free proteins, phi p, in a solution times a binding constant. Or you could say, well, it's equal to the volume fraction, phi p, divided by some critical concentration of proteins, like a critical aggregation concentration. The second thing which is important is the stoichiometry. So, so the stoichiometry tells you what the ratio is of the number of binding sites in your solution and the, and the number of proteins. And stoichiometry turns out to be extremely important to the success of this process. And finally, because this is a nucleated process, it's, you know, it's a, a cooperativity plays an important role and is captured by a parameter that, from the, uh, that we call sigma. And that's, again, a Boltzmann factor involving this free energy that you have to pay, H, and the free energy epsilon of the binding because you know, the, the very first protein that binds doesn't have a neighbor. So it actually, in essence, loses that. Right? Okay, so this allows you to calculate the the, the size distribution, so how many proteins are on average assembled onto the templates. Well, what is G and epsilon? So, so G is the binding energy of the protein to the template, and ep epsilon is the, the binding energy of two code proteins that are, that are in contact. 
And then uh, H again is this free energy that you have to pay in order to morph the protein into its wrong shape. It's, it's, it's the stacking energy, yes. Yeah, it's a stacking energy. And then, you know, if, if you look at the stacks in the free solution, that might have a slightly different stacking of free energy. Because the, uh, the, the, the template will position um, the planar groups in such a way that you're not losing as much entropy as you would in free solution, but never mind. So you can also write down your rate equations. I'm not going to show them. You know, you have an empty one, and then you have one, you have two, you have three, one can fall off. And in essence, you've got so forward rates, which depends on the number of proteins on the template. Uh, this is the backward rate, this is the forward rate. And these two are connected through microscopic reversibility, uh, meaning that they're connected to these energy scales that we have in the problem. And uh, then you stick this into Mathematica, or you write a program, and you can calculate the, the non-equilibrium distribution um, of the number of proteins adsorbed onto a template. Right? Let, let's first have a look at the equilibrium distribution, because that tells us why it is advantageous to zipper. And the reason is as follows. Um, so on the vertical axis, we've got the base 10 log of the probability of having n proteins on the template um, relative to having no uh, proteins on the template as a function of the number of binding sites. And uh, so, so these lines are what we find depending on the ratio of the concentration relative to the critical concentration. right? So this blue line gives you uh, this ratio. Uh, we were just below the critical concentration, 0.98. This red line gives you the, the distribution exactly at the uh, critical concentration, 1.02, oh, just above, one, just above. So whether you're below or above, you always have an exponentially decaying function. But it depends on from what side of the assembly. So if you're below, um, the critical concentration, your exponential decay makes assemblies even less stable than the monomers, I mean, than the f uh, free templates, which, which sit over here. Exactly at the critical concentration, we, we have got a flatliner. We've got a flatliner which is below the critical one, uh, the empty one. So you, you still don't see templated um, assemblies. You have to go slightly above it, and only slightly, which means that this process is, well, highly cooperative. You have to go a little bit above it. And what we see is that we have complete ones, so an exponential distribution now starting at the complete ones and going down. And this means that intermediates are suppressed. To suppress intermediates is crucial. Why is it crucial? It's crucial because you do not want to waste protein on incomplete viruses, right? So this is a way of having either no templates covered by protein or only ones that are complete, more or less. And this means also that if your stoichiometry is not right, which means that if you do not have a lot of protein, you're not wasting that protein on putting one or two proteins on a whole bunch of templates. Those few that you have, you put on one. That one survives. Right? Does it mean that you have kind of waiting time that you it's yes. very rare you have to wait yeah, time? Yeah, 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 yeah. So it's a highly nucleated process. So you have to, there is a lag time. I'll show, if I'm not going over time, I might be showing you some graphs as well. And so, first of all, the transition is really sharp. So it is really a, a critical concentration. A second of all, intermediates are suppressed. And finally, you know, um, even if your, if your protein concentration is just a little bit above the critical one, if your template is long enough, it will actually encapsulate it. So the cooperativity increases with the length of the template, which is why you can increase the length of your RNA of TMV and still have complete viruses. And in fact, there's like, there are zillions of patterns out there where people put genes on the genome of TMV to produce in tobacco plants. OK, so. 
first of all, um, the slope of this line depends on the binding infinity. So, you know, the larger the binding infinity, the, the, the more steeper the slope. But at the same time, stoichiometry does the, the opposite way. So if you starve the solution of protein, then the then, then this slope goes down and down and down, which means at some point you're going to lose complete uh, coverage. Of, actually, you will not get any coverage at all. OK, dynamics. So let us do an experiment. And let's uh, take um, a bit of DNA, which is, consists of 51 binding sites. The, the cooperativity has a value of 0 0.007, which is, which is a typical level of cooperativity that you also find in supramolecular polymers, so in organic chemistry. And so I just how in your theory the cooperativity is? It's, a, it's ether. Where did it appear in your theory? I'll show. So, so, so it's this Boltzmann factor involving this free energy barrier that you have. And then the absence of a, li of, of a bond, which also acts like a barrier. Yeah, not at all. All right. La di da di da. Oh, whoops. So, um, Q is 51, sigma is 0 0.007. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yes. If I do correctly what you said before, that if you have many one dimensional objects like that, you will end up big up some and leaving the yes. Dimension. Yes. I know about assembly in one dimension, you always have a distribution. Yes. And an average size shows yes. the square root of the uh, yes, I, I, I agree, but we're actually making use of the fact that you have to turn the protein into something that is able to absorb. So you're killing entropy through energy. I forgot to mention that. Yes, entropy bad, energy good. So we're killing, in essence, why you don't have a phase transition in 1D if your interaction range is finite. Right? So by having this... Yes, yeah, yeah. It's a different type. I, I, I can talk about it after my talk if you want, because it's a little bit technical. Actually, it's not that technical, but anyway. Yeah. OK, so we start off with only empty templates. And uh, that's here, the, um, this axis here. As a function of the log of time, I've scaled the log to this level of cooperativity, because the level of co cooperativity dictates your lag time. So that's taken out now. Uh, um, for two different stoichiometries, stoichiometry is zero, means an infinite amount of protein out there, so you're never depleted of, of protein. And a stoichiometry of 1.5, which means that you haven't got enough protein to cover all of the assemblies. Now, for short times, uh, the probability of finding uh, empty proteins, uh, empty templates, starts at one, and then it goes down and down and down and down and down, 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 down. It's a song. And it's only at the later stages that you start to see a difference between excess protein and not excess protein, so depletion of protein. It's after a while, it, it takes a while for the uh, proteins to register that there are not, of, uh, that there are not um, enough of them around. And then if you have um, excess protein, you know, in the end, you end up with almost no uh, empty um, templates. If, however, the number of proteins is, done, is not sufficient to cover all of the uh, templates, then at some point you start to level off because some of them will remain empty. This is exactly what we want. Uh, notice there is a little bit of a, an undershoot. Uh, if we look at, on the right-hand side, so in blue, that's the probability of having a complete capsid. Um, so for a stoichiometry of zero, so an infinite amount of protein, it goes like that, and it's really sharp, and whoop, goes like that. However, if I don't have enough protein, um, I will still be able to make complete viruses. This is the cool thing about this. Right? And it goes up, I overshoot a little bit, and then I go down again. Right? So we have 
uh, undershoots and overshoots. And here, these undershoots and overshoots, they only, in the theory, happen only if you do not have enough protein in the solution. Never when you have an excess protein. Never. And this will, I'll show you later if I have enough time. Anyway. Um, well, you can also look at the average um, um, coverage, theta, as a function of time for two different concentrations now. So, so the red curves are for an, um, excess pro uh, protein, and the blue ones are for not enough protein for two different concentrations. So the concentration is here e to the power 3. That's about 20, I think. 20 times the critical one. And uh, E is about 3, the 3 times the critical concentration. So you see that. Uh, the larger the concentration, the quicker the assembly goes. And this is also, in a, in a way, what you expect, because the thermodynamic driving force is larger. Um, you can't see it, but there is a little bit of an overshoot over that. So again, if you don't have enough protein, you get an overshoot. It is very, very small here. But you, you, the largest overshoot we can get is about 100%. And they're very, very long lasted. So the relaxation time takes, I mean, it takes a very long time for this maximum to go away again. And I think this, you know, uh, crawls back a little bit to what some people have called the pseudo law of mass action. Because if you think that that maximum that I can see and you cannot see, because I believe it's there, you know, it takes a very long time to even out. So if you take that as your, your um, the fraction occupied size and you calculate back your binding free energy, then the binding free energy that you get is wrong. Okay, so there are overshoots, undershoots, uh, depending on the concentration, depending on the stoichiometry. Um, overshoots in, in theta, and, that, and that's the thing that we're going to measure, we only see up here, so for large values of lambda, so in, in the conditions of excess protein. Okay, I'll come back to that, uh, hopefully, in about five minutes' time, if I have that time. Okay, let's go back to our, our TMV protein. So if... TMV protein has uh, functionalities. One functionality is one part of the protein has to wrap itself around the RNA and do the death knell, as it were. It undergoes this conformational change. There's a part of the protein that is involved in, in, in the interaction with neighboring um, coproteins, and then there, there, there is a part that imparts colloidal stability. We call this shielding, colloidal stability to the particles, because you don't want them to drop out of solution. So this is our, well, I mean, if you make something in the lab, it doesn't look as nice as when nature makes something. But it, it does the trick. So we have a binding um, sequence. It's basic. It's like 12 lysines. It's positively charged. There is a silk-like block, which consists of a certain number, n, times um, a silk-like sequence, uh, guanine, arginine, arginine, blah, blah, blah. And we can vary the number of those sequences, one, so 0, 1, 2, all the way up to 18. And then we've got our shielding block, which is a collagen-like block, about 400 amino acids, which um, imparts this colloidal stability to the complexes, because you're neutralizing something that is charged. Right? So you need your colloidal stability. Now, it turns out that this silk-like block is able to form either a beta sheet or a beta barrel, depending on how big this N is, and depending also on the concentration. If you, for instance, take um, four of those units, then this object will not undergo this conformational change into a beta sheet. And we know this because we do circular dichroism. And what happens is here. So this is a 2.5 kilo base pair of double-stranded uh, DNA. This is an AFM image. And essentially what happens is you have, because this is positively charged, it will just adsorb, like in the usual way, in the Langmuir way. It's not actually packaging the DNA. And in fact, if you expose it to nucleases, the nucleases will <coughs> kill the, the DNA. Um, if you take 10 of those sequences, or 12, or 14, or whatever, then what happens is that this is the same length of DNA. Now it's packaged into something that is a lot shorter than the original length. So somehow it's been packaged in this object. If you expose this to nucleases, it's protected. And so um, it shows that having this conformational 
change is kind of important in order to be able to protect um, the RNA, uh, the, in this case, the DNA. Okay, dynamics, because we're interested in dynamics. So this is what happens in, <laughs> if you do an experiment. So you, so, so you mix um, the artificial core protein with the DNA, and every so many minutes you take a little bit of, of a volume and you deposit it on the surface and you do your AFM. You clean it, etc. Blah, 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 et and so this is at short times, somewhat longer times, somewhat longer, longer times. So we're actually seeing growth from one end. It starts to grow at one end. Um, hang on, we, we didn't put in this origin of assembly. I'm good, thank you. We didn't put in the origin of assembly. So why does it start at one of the ends and not somewhere in the middle? Well, look at its tail. This is a big, it's a polymer. It's a coil, it's a random coil. Radius of gyration, 50 nanometers. So you're absorbing, actually this um, goes back to a question that Robin was asking <laughs> about an hour ago. You know, if you, if you take a polymer, you, you try to put it onto the surface, the, this polymer senses the presence of that surface. So it, the surface, in a way, repels it because of entropy. So if it absorbs towards the end, you don't have that yet. So even though we did not build in this origin of assembly, by accident we did. But hey, who cares? OK, now I'm almost done. So we did, as a function of time, measure the length um, of this growing uh, virus-like particle. For, this is for the uh, CS10b. So we have 10 of those uh, sequences as a function of time. Um, these bars are the experimental data. And in red is, is, is our uh, theory. Now, I, I will not bore you with how we did the curve fitting, because we had many parameters. The curve fitting is, is extremely difficult, exactly because you have so many parameters. So you have to just believe, we, believe me that we didn't do anything wrong or fibbed or whatever. I'm not going to tell you that. <laughs> it's less than what string theorists have, I think. Anyway, the cool thing that you already see is this exponential distribution for late times. That's this exponential distribution, this inverted exponential distribution I showed you that came out of the equilibrium model. So for late times, we're able to uh, extract the, uh, the, the, the energies that we need to put in. Uh, we did the same thing for a protein with 14 of those sequences. And again, so these, these are the experimental data. And this is our, these are our curve fits, which are not brilliant, but they seem to follow um, what we see in experiment. And I have to say, so, so these were AFM-based measurements. Your statistics are not that good. So one of those bars here could represent maybe 10 viruses. Excuse me, virus-like particles. But so your statistics are not that good. Anyway, so we can, from our curve fits, we can extract um, the energies. So the, um, the binding energy to the surface, the, the protein-protein binding energy combined gives, gives us minus 17 kT for both. Um, the free energy barrier to assembly is, for, is 1, 6 kT, and 3 for the other one. And we can also back out to the forward rate, which is in minutes, 4 times 10 to the power of 9. Now, what these numbers mean, <laughs> Well, we have to do more experiments to see changes in these parameters to be able to interpret what we are seeing. What we can do, of course, is compare with our curve fitting, what we did ages ago, to the experimental data on TMV. And interestingly enough, so the binding energies are very similar. So we get 17 kBT for TMV, um, an energy barrier of 7 kBT, uh, and a forward rate, which is actually a factor of 10 um, smaller than for our uh, artificial virus. OK, I, I, I mentioned statistics. And this, I have a little, how much more time do I have? Uh, I have two more slides, this one and then the next one, and then I'll, I'll shut up. So I will, not, I will not show you some more new theory, unfortunately, even though that's the more interesting. No, 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 the experiments are cool. So what we did is try, OK, so how can we get better statistics? Um, you know what, what, I mean, doing AFM is not going to help you. So what we did, we replaced the DNA by a proxy genome. 
And this a proxy genome um, is um, optomechanically active, which means that if you stretch it, its luminescence changes, which is really cool. And this is what we find, right? So by looking at the, at the, at the luminescence, by looking at, at, at two peaks and taking the ratio, we call this the fraction of a taut structure. Taut is like <coughs> you stretch on it. So this is at a concentration of 0.06 micromolars for stoichiometry. So F plus here means the number of positive charges uh, relative to the total number of charges. So if F plus is a half, I have perfect stoichiometric, stoichiometric matching of the to total number of positive charges and negative charges. Let's look at uh, uh, 0.1. So I don't have enough positive charge. I don't have enough protein. So I, uh, my system starves of protein. Time equals zero, goes up, the signal goes up, and that goes up a little bit more. At the uh, exact stoichiometric ratio of 0.5, that's the green curve, uh, it goes up, it sort of seems to level off a little bit, and then whoop, it takes off. And the same is true if we have too much protein there. Um, now, this now we interpret as initially as a Langmuir type absorption. So the first thing that these objects do is they just indeed absorb onto the DNA without doing anything to the DNA. You have to wait a little bit. This is the nucleation process. After a while, they start to think, hmm, maybe I want to package it. And that's when the zippering happens. So there is a nucleation process, and then zipping and packaging of the DNA. And um, so we, we did the same experiments at a concentration 10 times higher, and then where things started to happen. And this is also, I think, where our model protein starts to diverge from the actual TMV uh, code protein. Because, for instance, if we look at the, uh, at the blue curve here, that's at a stoichiometric ratio of 0.7, so you have 20% more charges, in, positive charges in your solution that you actually need. You know, you've got your lag time, and then it goes up, starts to zip, and then, oh dear, I have an overshoot. And my first reaction was, I predicted this. Except this happens at excess protein, where my theory tells me, uh, no, Paul, there's no overshoot. OK, so how do I weasel myself out of this? Because I will. Uh, first of all, we know that if we only have protein in the solution at high enough concentrations, it will form assemblies. So there's parasitic self-assembly. And second of all, we know, and I don't have time to explain this, by using a different optomechanical probe that is able to measure, to probe whether or not I have one template encapsulated, two or three or four. So we know that what happens here is also co-assembly of templates. So instead of encapsulating just one proxy genome, and we're encapsulating many more which is also what happened with CCMV, remember? The early experiments of Adam Zlotnick. OK, with this, OK, I'm not going to show this. No, no, that's, no, 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 we have a theory, blah, blah, blah. Does theory exp explain the data? Yeah. <laughs> OK, so finally, um, so protein polymers can be designed to mimic code proteins of linear viruses, which is cool. Uh, our model tri-block protein copolymer successfully encapsulates uh, DNA, and in fact it transfects, which is kind of, I didn't mention that. Uh, I think that allostery and directional assembly are crucial if you want to encapsulate a linear object. So you have to beat entropy. Um, so the kinetic zipper model describes the time evolution of encapsulated DNA reasonably well. We predict over and undershooting in the conditions of excess DNA. Uh, oh, I should have, excess DNA, not excess uh, protein. And overshooting under conditions of excess protein may occur in competition when you have, for instance, mycelization. That's what the model actually tells you that I didn't have time to explain. And with that, I would like to thank you for your attention. And if there are any questions, just let me know.